Sub-Saharan Africa comprises many countries that are rich in mineral resources, but extremely poor in the real world. For example, the Democratic Republic of Congo is one of the world's poorest countries, despite being the world's largest cobalt producer and a top five producer of copper and diamonds. Zimbabwe is also desperately poor, despite its substantial platinum and palladium production, as well as its lithium resources. Tanzania has failed to lift up its economy, despite exporting a lot of gold, silver, and copper, and having notable graphite and rare earth deposits. And sadly, the list goes on and on. But one country in Sub-Saharan Africa has managed to completely defy the African resource curse, Botswana. The Republic of Botswana is the world's second largest diamond producer after Russia, with its approximately 22 million carats, accounting for 20% of global rough diamond production by value in 2021. More importantly, it ranks first among the 43 countries of mainland Sub-Saharan Africa for GDP per capita on a purchasing power basis, first in the same region for life expectancy, and third in the region for Human Development Index Score, which measures a range of criteria related to standard of living. Botswana has had the fourth highest average annual growth rate in the world since 1966, at almost 5%, putting it behind only the People's Republic of China, South Korea, and Singapore. All this raises an obvious question. How? How in the world did Botswana achieve what so many of its neighbours in Sub-Saharan Africa have so spectacularly failed to do and turn its geological endowment into sustained economic success? And how did it manage this given that, at the time of its independence from the United Kingdom in 1966, it was the 11th poorest country in the world on a per capita basis, with one fifth of its population at risk of starvation? Many factors have contributed to Botswana's economic success, some of which simply involved good fortune. For starters, Botswana is sparsely populated. Its population of around 2.4 million people is barely more than that of the official city of Paris. Yet its 582,000 square kilometre territory is bigger than all of metropolitan France. This is a huge advantage when building a mine because it reduces the chance of having an impact on and drawing the ire of local communities. It also means there are fewer citizens expecting to share in the proceeds of any mining revenues. Moreover, the mineral Botswana happens to have in abundance. Diamonds has seen consistent growth in demand for more than a century and hasn't suffered from the crazy price fluctuations associated with most mined products, leading to fairly predictable year-on-year -year revenues. But much of the credit must also go to the government of Botswana for upholding principles of democracy, economic freedom and good governance going all the way back to the first president, Saritsi Kama, who led the country from 1966 through to his death in 1980. Kama had been Posi, or King, of the Bamangwata people, one of the principal Swana chieftaincies of Botswana since the age of four, although his uncle acted as regent for a long time while he was sent to be educated in South Africa. As a young adult, Kama moved to Britain, where he studied at Oxford and, in 1948, married a white Englishwoman named Ruth Williams. The marriage angered both the tribal elders, who demanded he choose a Bamangwata wife or renounce the throne, as well as a new apartheid regime in neighbouring South Africa, which had just banned interracial marriage. Fearing South Africa's reaction, the British government banned Kama from returning home for more than a decade, although he did maintain his right to the throne. Kama's encounter with racial prejudice, in addition to observations of mistakes made in other African countries, most of which had obtained their independence before Botswana, surely had an impact on his approach to governance. After he and his Botswana Democratic Party won the country's inaugural elections, they oversaw the establishment of a constitution devoted to safeguarding the fundamental rights and freedoms of all individuals. Not only those of Kama's Swana ethnic majority, but also those of minorities such as the Kalunga people, the second largest ethnic group in Botswana, and the small white and Indian communities. In doing so, Botswana was able to brand itself as a model for racial harmony, in stark contrast to its more powerful southern neighbour at the time, and prevent capital outflow. Another of Kama's early decisions that contributed to Botswana's long-term stability was to maintain the tradition of hotlas, or public meetings. These meetings are usually headed by the village chief with decisions made by consensus. Because of this tradition, Botswana claims to be one of the world's oldest democracies. The 1966 constitution enshrined freedoms of expression, assembly, and association into law, and public consultations at a tribal level continue to impact decisions at a national level to this day. All this meant Botswana was heading in the right direction when, 
De Beers, which had begun prospecting in what was then the British Protectorate of Bechuanaland in 1938, discovered the giant Orapa kimberlite diamond field in 1967, just one year after Botswana's independence. This event triggered a major exploration boom across Botswana that led to the discovery of several other major diamond-bearing kimberlites in the ensuing decades. One could imagine negotiations between the government of Botswana and De Beers going badly, given that De Beers was a South African company that was, despite Chairman Harry Oppenheimer's personal opposition to apartheid, probably the biggest single contributor to the apartheid-era South African economy. But whatever went on behind closed doors, it worked, because Botswana and De Beers quickly agreed to form a joint venture known as Debswana, with the Botswana government holding 15% of the venture at the time of its founding in 1969, a share that increased to the current 50% by 1975. Debswana would go on to open the Orapa, Letakana and Juaneng mines, all of which still operate today, as well as the Dumcha mine, which halted operations in 2021. Today, these operations provide direct and indirect employment for more than 34,000 Botswanans, more than 3% of the country's entire labor force. Botswana's economy grew in lockstep with its diamond operations, and by 2001, the country was in such a strong financial position that it was able to join a consortium that bought out to be as South African investors and took the company private. Today, the government of the Republic of Botswana holds a 15% share in De Beers, making it a junior partner to the London headquartered multinational mining giant Anglo-American, which holds 85%. This means the Botswana Treasury generates substantial revenues, not only from diamonds produced inside its borders, but also from those produced in De Beers operations in South Africa, Namibia and Canada, which, together with the Botswana operations, produce more than one third of all the world's rough diamonds by value. Furthermore, it gives the government of Botswana a stake in De Beers' extensive network of subsidiaries, which includes sales operations in Botswana, South Africa, Namibia and Singapore, as well as Element 6, a company specialising in engineering materials for production of synthetic diamond and tungsten materials, and the renowned for Evermark and De Beers Jewelers brands, which include stores in high-end fashion districts in New York, London, Hong Kong and other cities. This arrangement could still have gone to waste with poor governance, but the Botswana government, despite being led by the same party since independence, has resisted the temptation to line the pockets of its officials at the expense of its population. As the economist Robert Guest noted in his 2004 book, The Shackled Continent, in the last 35 years, Botswana's economy has grown faster than any other in the world, yet cabinet ministers have not awarded themselves mansions and helicopters, and even the president has been seen doing his own shopping. Instead, as the International Monetary Fund has noted, Botswana has managed its diamond revenues in a prudent and transparent manner, allocating a good share of government spending to health, education, social assistance, and investment in public infrastructure, all while building up sizable savings that can be used to stabilize the economy in the event of a downturn, or to invest in future generations. Today, Botswana is the least corrupt country in all of mainland Africa, and is less corrupt than almost half the members of the European Union, including Spain, Italy and Poland, according to Transparency International's Annual Corruption Perceptions Index. Additionally, it is first in mainland Africa for economic freedom, ranking equal to Israel and the United Arab Emirates, and ahead of France, according to the Fraser Institute's annual report on this subject. This is not to say that Botswana isn't without its problems. Its government has been accused of removing San, or Bushmen, indigenous hunter-gatherers that are the oldest surviving culture in Southern Africa, from their homes in the central Kalahari game reserve after De Beers discovered the Gope deposit, later renamed Gagu, in the 1980s, and subsequently proceeded to mine it. According to a report from Survival International, many San now live in resettlement camps outside the reserve, where they are dependent on government handouts and suffer from high percentages of alcoholism, depression, and AIDS. Ongoing opposition and legal challenges from the San people and their supporters were likely factors in the decision by De Beers and his partner Extrada to sell Gagu to British mining company Gem Diamonds in 2007 and the decision by Gem to seize operations of the mine in 2017 and to attempt to sell it, so far without success, to other parties. Another concern for Botswana is that more than half a century after independence, it still generates about 30% of its revenues and 70% of its foreign exchange earnings from diamonds, despite achieving some level of economic diversification in recent years. Debswana's three active mines have enough reserves to keep going for 15, 16 and 22 years respectively, while the one other active diamond mine in Botswana, Karoi, 
which is operated by Canadian firm Lucara Diamond Corp, will keep operating as an open pit mine until 2026, but could potentially extend its life by transitioning into an underground mine. Additionally, the government's share in De Beers' global operations could keep generating revenue for decades to come. However, even if more deposits are discovered, Botswana cannot, to borrow a line from James Bond, afford to rely on diamonds forever. Despite its many economic achievements, Botswana today suffers from 26% unemployment, and around one in six of its people still fall below the World Bank's international poverty line of $2.15 per day. The government has recognised the need to carry out reforms to encourage economic diversification, such as reducing bureaucratic regulations, privatising inefficient state-owned enterprises, and spending on education programmes to build skills in the labour force. Diversification could include the mining of minerals other than diamonds. Indeed, a number of foreign mining firms are developing projects in Botswana involving copper, cobalt, nickel, silver, platinum group metals, and other minerals. But as international organisations like the IMF have suggested, and the Botswana government too has recognised, it must also strive to diversify towards other areas, such as financial services, manufacturing and tourism, the latter of which holds great potentials given the wonders of the Okavango Delta. However it goes about addressing this challenge, decisions made today will go a long way to determining whether Botswana continues to be Sub-Saharan Africa's greatest economic success story or falls into a sort of secondary resource trap, that of a country that fails to prepare its economy for the post-mining boom. I'm Nadav for Mining the World. If you learned something new from this video, please show your appreciation by liking and subscribing, and wherever you are in this mineral-rich world of ours, thank you.